Hello, Davey here. Welcome to an air-cooled build and a Metallic Gear Neo G Mini. Now, I state air-cooled build. It's not normally something I do. I normally do uh, information-dense reviews and long-form length. Uh, so, last week we did a water-cooled build as part of the full review of this case. It lasted about 40 minutes and it was as information-dense as I could possibly be. So, all the compatibility, all the information, pros, cons, are all gone through in that major review. So, you can check that in the top right-hand corner. Um, as for air-cooling, I wanted to go over something quite information-dense for this as well. Uh, so half of this video really is talking about graphs, figures, setups, and that sort of stuff. In this uh, in this video, I'm setting this case up in 16 different configurations. Uh, so that includes different configurations of the GPU position, whether it's uh, further in or further out. Uh, different fan configurations, so stock front fan, which is where it comes as stock. Uh, two front intakes, two side intakes, and four intakes in total using front and side. Uh, I have also done testing on tower coolers and downdraft coolers, or specifically two coolers. Uh, that perform very similarly on an open air test bench. Uh, so we want to see how that will perform inside the case itself. So I've done all these different things. I haven't really done any B-roll for this video because frankly I want to make it information dense and that just takes time that most people don't really watch. If you want to see B-roll, head to that video I mentioned earlier on. So without further ado, if you want to pick up this case on Amazon, you can head to the Amazon affiliate links in the video description. And anything you purchase through there, be it the case or toilet roll, it will give a small kickback to the channel between 4 and 12% depending on what you buy and what region you purchase it in. And if you want to go to the video description, you'll also find timestamps uh, so you can skip to any particular part of the video you fancy watching at a particular time uh, just to make it I don't know useful so if you find something that is a little bit boring and you want to skip forward then you can do so with ease down there also the first pinned comment for mobile users so thanks very much guys and I'll catch you in a second uh, for going over all of the different setups so last week we covered this Neo G Mini in a 40 minute review where we built a water cooled system. If you want to check out all the compatibility information and have a full breakdown of the case with an all round conclusion, please head over to that video. But if you're looking for air cooled specific information about this case, this is the video you need. We'll do a quick run through of the air cooled systems first. In total I've tested the case in 16 different setups including different fan layouts and tower and downdraft CPU coolers. So for the first setup, with the graphics card in the furthest position from the motherboard, we've got just about 100mm of space for a CPU cooler. Now a 100mm CPU cooler isn't part of my cooling setups, but I have got a 79mm tower cooler in the form of the Silverstone AR10115XS. For those of you coming over from the water cooled video, I've now shifted the boot SSD up top where the pump was. This case only has support for two 2.5 inch drives, so my third needs to go somewhere a little more creative. With the cooler in place, the graphics card can now be put in place too. I've tested this case with the graphics card in both the closest and furthest positions from the motherboard, but we'll get into that a little later. As for the fans, we've got a couple of 140mm intakes that came over from the water cooling build, and we're throwing in the maximum two 120mm fans to the sides as intakes. Something I haven't tested was the front fans as exhaust, since they'd be working against the fan of the power supply unit, and I have no inclination that this would be an optimal setup. But I'm also testing the system in all variations with the original stock single fan to know what you get out of the box. Now, steering away from the case for a moment, we've got a first for the channel. This is the EVGA Supernova 750G3. As the name suggests, it's a 750 watt power supply unit with an 80 plus gold efficiency rating. It's also fully modular with an eco switch for lower fan speeds. But that's nothing special in itself. I mean, it's a really nice upgrade from the NEX 750B I've been using in build so far, and it's 10mm smaller in length. But no, what makes this power supply unit special for the channel is it came with 7 Varda fans in Noctua boxes, mostly. Now the fans are a little dusty, as is the power supply unit, but that's nothing compressed air and toilet roll can't fix. However, the most important factor here is it all came in a care package from Ben Cross, a long-term supporter of the channel. He got in touch with me after hearing me mention my previous power supply unit was a little noisy and its fan was always spinning, and he said he was upgrading his power supply unit so I could have his current one. He offered to send the power supply unit completely for free, just looking to support the channel. But I felt a little weird about that, so we settled on a price and he sent it over to me without mentioning all the fans he was also sending, which happened to be the exact fans I've been using for the channel to date. So if you too are a supporter of the channel, please thank Ben Cross for all the new kit in the comments. And of course, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Ben myself. This should maintain the cooling requirements of the channel for years to come, and the power supply unit is already a world better than the last one. 
So back to the case. To save time, the G3 can be thrown into position and I've sorted all the wiring and cable management off screen, but I almost completely gave up on the two side fan intakes since the cable management space between the motherboard tray and the side panel is so minimal. I was facing issues where any wires behind the fans would eventually get caught by the fan blades. Cable management space is by far this case's biggest problem, but after spending an extra half an hour reworking the cables, I was able to strap all the cables in positions where they wouldn't clip the fan blades. But it was painful, and I hope future revisions focus a little more on functionality to match this case's good looks. And to add insult to injury, I gave up on trying to replace the side panel with the filter on since it clashed with the SATA data cables. If you can't comfortably rotate a SATA data cable without it pressing against the side panel, the cable management has been completely incorrectly designed, in my opinion. So what I was getting at was the filter had to be removed since if you place anything behind it, it'll likely be pressed into the fan blades. And as for my testing with regards to the side of the case, it won't be including a side filter at all. I could have placed the side filter on the outside, but I don't think that's reasonable on, well, pretty much any case. So take this into account when looking at the results later. So we've got all the fans in place and my testing covered the front fans only, side fans only and side and front fans together. And as mentioned earlier, I've tested all the configurations with the GPU furthest from the motherboard like this and closest to the slots of the motherboard like you see here. With the graphics card closest to the motherboard, you can only fit up to an 80mm cooler. And unfortunately, some of the finish of my 1070s backplate was worn away after rubbing up against the 80mm tall AR10115XS cooler, or 79mm tall cooler. And here I was just returning the case to its stock fan setup, which turns out to be a single 120mm RGB fan that spins up to 1400 RPM, at least in my case. After all the testing was complete with the Silverstone AR10115XS tower cooler, I changed over to the Noctua NH-L9X65 which is a 65mm tall downdraft cooler. I've also placed my painted version of the A9X14 fan on the L9X65 which still performs as well as the original fan did. If you're wondering what the specification differences between the L9X65 and the AR10115XS are, you can find them on the screen now. But the key differences are the style of the cooler, the size of the coolers, and the airflow rates of the fans on the coolers. So at this point you probably want to shift onto the results, so we'll go ahead and do that in just a second. Something that is worth showing is the L9X65 in position with the graphics card closest to the motherboard. Since there's only 80mm of clearance, the cooler is 75mm tall, that leaves a 15mm gap between the two. But half of the L9X65 isn't covered up by the graphics card, but is right next to the exhaust of the graphics card which may have an impact on the thermals. Oh yeah, and uh, very last thing before thermals, here is the thermal paste spread of the L9X65. Is that foreshadowing? Well, there's only one way to find out. So these are the results from the experimental portion of the testing. This is where I messed around with different configurations of the fans and coolers and tested them with Prom95 for full CPU load and Fermark for full GPU load. The graphs are ordered by CPU temperature, hottest at the bottom and coolest at the top, and it's also worth noting that all fans in the system were spinning at 100% speed in every test to remove fan curve variables, and the temperatures are logged in degrees Celsius in a Delta T format. If you want an idea of the true temperatures of the components, then you can add about 20 degrees to the results and you won't be far off. As for digesting what the hell went on throughout these tests, I've broken them down into different variables. So first up is the battle between downdraft and tower coolers in this case. So here are all the results for the L9X65 which is our downdraft cooler. Notice there are two clusters to so the top center and bottom. And switching over to the tower cooler being the AR10115XS, we are seeing the opposing spread of results. It's also worth knowing that the AR10115XS on an open air test bench performs only 0.6 degrees Celsius cooler than the L9X65 on the 10 minute Prime 95 test. So they're very comparable outside of the case, but inside of the case there's a distinct difference. So we've established the AR10115XS tower cooler is the one to go for on a thermal standpoint, but what do these clusters mean? Well, looking at all the stock fan results, they're very much in the lower half, and adding all the two fan intake results shows us, regardless of the cooler, the front intake at full CPU load is the worst performing setup. Taking a look at the clock speeds on the right, all but one of these results is thermal throttling, to a certain degree, some more than others. The upper half of the results feature an even spread of the side intake results labelled 2x side intake fans and the front with side intake results labelled 4x intake fans, but it's also worth noting that the differences between say the top two results are the two extra fans that yielded a 2 degree improvement on the graphics card only. 
And finally, something that's really important with regards to this case in particular, the position of the graphics card. Now for this I had to rearrange the order of the graphs by GPU temperatures, which is the only way you can make ends of this information. So looking at the graphics card furthest from the motherboard results, labelled GPU far, they are on average hotter than the GPU closest to the motherboard results, which are labelled GPU close. So the main takeaway from looking at these results is that if you want the best graphics card performance you need to throw in 4 fans and have a downdraft cooler to help with the extraction of the hot air from the GPU heatsink as mentioned earlier. And if you want the best CPU results it doesn't matter where the GPU is as long as you have an unfiltered side intake and a small tower cooler. But small tower coolers that are as quiet as the downdraft cooler we've used here at the same performance level are hard to come by. And if you have no idea what you're doing, then you'll place your graphics card right against the glass, leave the stock fan in, and throw a downdraft cooler in for good measure. But like with any test, these tests are not inclusive of every downdraft and tower cooler, but the two we've tested today are very comparable on an open air test bench. And um, I was being facetious about the if you have no idea what you're doing comment. Some people aren't performance driven with regards to their builds, and that's completely fine. So believe it or not, that's the first half of the thermal testing completed. What we'll quickly do now is run through the best stock fan result, best optimal cooling result, and compare those with the open test bench results. I would be comparing these with a pile of other cases, but since the test benches have been recently reconfigured, all the results need building up over time. Skipping ahead to Firestrike Graphics Test 2, the stock fan of the Neo G Mini forced a 5 degrees C hotter GPU result than the test benches, which actually all need retesting to create individual GPU temperature results instead of copying the GPU temperature results from the previous test bench run. But to see some CPU differences appear, the physics test of Firestrike actually reveals more than the initial glance shows. Actually, all the tests show more than you'd initially see. If we compare the test bench AR10 CPU result with the two Neo G Mini results, there's a 6 degree increase with the optimal setup and nearly a 10 degree difference with the stock setup. Considering this is only a 30 second test, that's a pretty large difference. Someone might want to complain about the GPU temps on the optimal Neo G Mini being cooler than the open air test bench, and while that's initially strange, the GPU was mostly inactive during this test so cooling down, but the Neo G Mini was providing active cooling from its case fans, which the test bench doesn't have. I may need to create something to resolve this in the future. Skipping past Unigen benchmarks to keep the time down, Rise of the Tomb Raider doesn't reveal too many differences, but it is interesting to see that the active cooling of the case fans has the optimal CPU temperatures for just cooler than that of the 120mm D9L test bench temperatures, and the lesser active cooling of the stock fan has the 79mm tall tower cooler in the stock setup perform about as well as the 37mm tall L9i on the test bench. Only a few benchmarks left, skipping past Hitman, we'll check out the GTA 5 results, and then we'll compare the Prime 95 and Combustor results to round all of this off. Through GTA 5, the optimal setup performed nearly as well in CPU and GPU results as the open air test bench AR10 results, but the stock setup of the Neo G Mini was nearly 9 degrees hotter on the GPU and 11 degrees hotter on the CPU, which isn't great, and this is all with the fans running at full speed. Last stop, Prime 95 for the CPU and Furmark for the GPU. So the open air test bench result for the AR10 had the CPU hit 53 degrees delta T and the GPU hit 35 degrees delta T. The optimal setup in the Neo G Mini was about 7 degrees hotter on the CPU and just over 1 degree cooler on the GPU which is great. But the stock fan fed far poorer, resulting in a 26 degree hotter CPU and a 15 degree hotter GPU. You also notice to the right that the Neo G Mini stock setup saw some thermal throttling on the CPU meaning it hit the true temperature of 100 degrees celsius which is awful but if you're not expecting to use your system at 100 load for over five minutes or so at a time then you should be fine without additional fans so that's pretty much that um obviously i'm in the same position as i was in the intro and i'm sure you understand for efficiency reasons and time reasons that is exactly why i'm doing this but a couple of points i want to go over the cable management space in this case is really its weakest link. Uh, you've got about seven to nine millimeters, I think, of cable management space, um, and that really is not enough, in my opinion, especially in mini ITX cases. A lot of people think, well, a mini ITX case, you know, everything gets smaller, but really in a lot of these cases, if you can fit an ATX power supply unit in there, you really can't afford, uh, you can't afford to like not have a lot of cable management space because you've got all the cables for an ATX build. 
And if you go with a mini ITX, um, uh, mini ITX power supply unit or an SFX power supply unit, like say the Corsair SF600 I've got on the shelf back there, uh, then the cables aren't long enough. And especially with that power supply unit, the cables are very rigid, uh, so it's very hard to flex them around. But yeah, you wouldn't have enough space really to do your build without having the cables just strewn in the main compartment without going back in behind the, uh, the motherboard tray. So cable management space really should be increased. It's nice to have that segment at the top where you can fold them here and there, but that isn't always very useful when you need to um, dress cables down the side in order to get them to the graphics card where I found I had some left over and it had to sort of wiggle around inside the main compartment to make it work. Um, but yeah, one thing I want to go over as well with the testing is it's very difficult from a tester's perspective uh, to get a sort of a perfect setup that will make everyone happy. Some people like only running their fans at 20 or 30% uh, on the PWM fan curve, which is basically as slow as you can go, and anything louder than that they get irritated with, and they'll say, oh, it's not quiet enough, it's not realistic, and some people will hate having a system go over 60 degrees, so they'll put everything in there possible to make it go as low as possibly can, and just say, we'll put headphones on. So. From my perspective, having full fan speed means there's no variables of fan curves, and of course you can negate those variables of fan curves, but it does get difficult to do when you have to make sure software plays ball all the time. Uh, and having and working out what tests to use as well, uh, different loads and that sort of stuff is difficult. So I have my full load test with uh, with Prime 95 and Combustor, that's my synthetic test. Uh, then we have some sort of um, semi-synthetic benchmarks such as Unit in Heaven, that sort of stuff, preset stuff. Uh, and then you have, um, say, things, um, your gaming benchmarks like uh, GTA, which has some physics, random physics in there, uh, such as cars crashing and things like that, um, and that throws in a bit more sort of different loads in there, hence why you see more CPU load in those benchmarks, and you don't see high CPU loads in Unigen Heaven, Superposition, and that sort of thing. So I do like to mix up the different load variants, um, but I always keep the fans at full speed to make sure that we have that consistency. And you can imagine if you reduce the airflow by half, say half fan speed, if that works out, if there's no special fan curves driven by the fan itself, then you can imagine the temperatures to increase um, a fair amount. Not double exactly, but increase a fair amount. So you could say a quarter or a third extra temperature on top of that. Um, so for the full load benchmarks, it might be more difficult, um, but for gaming benchmarks, it could be still reasonable. Um, but yeah, and then if you were to say, reduce the load on the CPU by a fair amount and you went to say lower texture qualities and that sort of stuff on GPU especially on that one uh, then you would see differences there. So that's pretty much that. I don't think there's much more to say. Remember if you do want to pick up this case from Amazon there are Amazon affiliate links in the video description. This case is actually surprisingly hard to get hold of so getting them on Amazon in certain regions is very difficult so apologies if I haven't covered all of those. I nearly had this in one take but I forgot a few things on the outro. So uh, if you want to support the channel as far as possible going above and beyond, you can always join the Patreon, which would be absolutely fantastic. I might run this over 20 seconds, so it might not appear right now. Uh, and if you want to get active uh, with, with the guys that are always keen to support the channel, always chatting about stuff with me, I do have a Discord as well, which you can probably see down the corner there, the symbol there, uh, but it's in the video description. You can join the Discord through that link uh, and get chatting as suggestions for the channel. Help me out when I have general questions and you know I, I want advice from you guys as to how I do things things on the channel uh, and just general chit chat about stuff. So uh, thanks so much for the support. If you want to check out the videos, they are there and I will catch you in the next one, which will be, I don't know, something, something, duh. maybe the Thermaltake 3200TG, maybe, something like that. Anyway, cheers guys. Bye-bye.